Well, thank you, Gail. Welcome, everyone, to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. We would, cannot thank Gail Carr-Williams and Chandra Allison for all the work that they do to make the Food for Thought series happen. Um, and also, we just really treasure our partnership with Vanderbilt's Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations. So, big thank you to them. Uh, today, we're going to be continuing the conversation we began last time about um, Kandinsky um, and music um, and spirituality and science. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on a kind of, um, little understood neurological phenomenon called synesthesia. And I'm thrilled to be joined on this panel with two um, people who are, are really far better experts on this topic than I am. I'm Dr. Bill Wetzel, who is the professor of neurology, or, or, excuse me, professor of neuropathology emeritus at Vanderbilt University, and Andy Campbell, who's the education and community engagement program manager at the Nashville Symphony. So Dr. Wetzel will give you a much better picture of synesthesia, but in short, it is a neuro neurological condition in which two of the five senses are crossed. So a synesthete, which is a tricky word to say, uh, might hear yellow, the color yellow as the shrill blast of a trumpet, or automatically see numbers in a specific range of colors. And synesthesia has fascinated artists, um, particularly in the 19th and 20th century. And um, so this is something that the decadent um, poets and writers were fascinated with. So someone like Horace Carl Wiesman is writing about his um, hero creating an organ of perfume so that he can play symphonies and synths. Um, so it kind of seizes the popular imagination, but it is a real condition that people do have. Um, so Kandinsky's relationship to synesthesia is, is somewhat murky. We know that he was very influenced by it um, and interested in it, but it is very difficult to pin down in the past whether he actually had the, um, the condition or not. So we'll kind of be exploring um, his interests and what he did say about it, and then um, Bill and Andy are going to talk about uh, synesthesia in a more concrete way. So for those of you who perhaps were not able to join us um, for our last panel discussion, I'll do a very quick introduction to Kandinsky. And if you haven't seen the exhibition, please, 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 please do yourselves a favor and go see it. It's beautiful um, and just a joy to behold. So um, Wassily Kandinsky was born into a wealthy merchant family in Moscow on December 4th in 1886. He had um, a very comfortable upper middle class lifestyle and he intended to uh, study the law and become a lawyer. Um, however, in 1896, at the age of 30, he had um, kind of a, a transportive experience with two works of art. And so he saw a painting by Claude Monet, one of his haystacks. We don't know if it was particularly this one, but he was struck by how Monet was able to dissolve forms um, into flecks of light um, and really looked and saw that the subject matter was perhaps less important than the way it was painted, that you could be transported by something as simple as a haystack um, in sun and snow. Uh, he also heard an opera by Wagner called Lohengrin, in that same year of 1896. And it was a bit of a revelation to him. And this is a quote from Kandinsky. And he says, upon hearing Lohengrin, I saw all my colors in my mind. They stood before my eyes. Wild, almost crazy lines were sketched in front of me. And I did not dare use the expression that Wagner had painted my hour musically. So in December of 1896, Kandinsky decided to quit his studies in the law and to move to Munich, Germany to be part of the artistic community there and pursue a career as an artist. And these are two earlier works in Kandinsky's career. Um, you can see here on um, the left, the Park of St. Clou of 1906. You can really see the influence of the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists in his painting style. He's kind of synthesized their ways of painting and is creating his own voice. Um, while he was, he, in 1906 when this was painted, he, he was in Paris, so he is a very, an artist who moves around a lot. Um, but while he was there, he also encountered the Fauves, so an artist like Matisse or Durain, who weren't so concerned with tying color to their natural reference. So a tree could be pink, a human figure could be red, that it was about using color to kind of tap into the spirit and a, a form of very personal expression. 
The other painting that we see here is called Song, and it was also painted in that year. And it conveys Kandinsky's interest in Russian folk culture and art. He's used dabs of bright colors to paint a scene of a Viking, sh a Viking ship sailing along the Volga River in medieval Russia. And like other avant-garde artists in the early 20th century, Kandinsky was very interested in um, ancient folk tales, religious icons, um, traditional arts and crafts, and non-Western art. He looked to pre-modern cultures as a source for a deeper connection with the spiritual world and for universal forms that might speak to all of humanity. I should also add that Kandinsky was a bit of a mystic. He grew up within the Russian Orthodox Church. He was very spiritual, and he saw the role of the artist as one to provide kind of a prophetic voice of things to come and um, the forms of the future, if you will. And he fell into a collective of artists who shared this vision. So um, in 1911, he's back in Munich, um, and with the artists Franz Marc, Gabriel Munter, and others, they form a collective called the Blue Rider. And they would publish um, an almanac that had um, a, an assemblage um, of a variety of images and sources from different cultures and disciplines. Um, uh, and this is the cover of, of the almanac from 1911, but they were very concerned with um, expressing spiritual truths with art. So again, moving kind of beyond the mundane, kind of lifting the veil to see uh, the, the, the spiritual world that we could all tap into regardless of um, the culture that we came from or our religion. And I love this quote from Kandinsky. Um, and so he says, I value only those artists who really are artists. That is, who consciously or unconsciously, in an entirely original form, embody the expression of their inner life, and who work only for this end and cannot work otherwise. So they're, they're very committed to this idea. Um, and in 1911, he also hears a concert by Arnold Schoenberg. Some of you may remember this from our last discussion. Um, but again, it was another kind of transportive moment where Schoenberg is... Um, kind of dissecting music and, and getting away from conventional harmonies with these atonal rhythms. And Kandinsky wants to be able to do that in, in painting. So we see here some sketches and, that were inspired by um, this Schoenberg concert. And you see them kind of gradually eroding away the content. You know, you, we can see a piano. We can see figures here. They've become <laughs> looser here. And then finally in the finished painting of 1911, um, we see these broad swaths of yellow and black, and there's a little suggestion of figuration, but it's really this very personal um, impression of what he saw. At the same time, he's formulating his ideas into a book called Concerning the Spiritual and Art, which was published in 1912. And he outlines his justifications for this kind of transportation, this move away from figurative content to non-objective art. Um, and he also talks a lot about this idea of inner necessity, that art should speak to, directly to your soul without the mediation of words or images and associations. Um, so throughout the book, he uses examples from the canon of art history. And so while he feels that Raphael's um, Holy Family of 1505 and 06 is a very effective and beautiful painting and one that he certainly appreciates that it doesn't speak to the 20th century experience, that we can find new ways of expressing our spirituality. And one of the most direct ways that Kandinsky thought that we could tap into this spirit was with color. Um, and so he saw that color just like music could evoke emotion. So when we hear music, um, we can feel somber or sad, hopeful or menacing without any referent to the natural world, but we can still tap into that. And he believed that color could do a similar job. He, and he said specifically, the color is the keyboard, the eye is the hammer, while the soul is a piano of many strings. The artist is the hand through which the medium of different keys causes the human soul to vibrate. And so this work of 1914, this is after the publication of Concerning the Spiritual and Art, where he has laid down some of his very specific ideas about the resonance of different colors. And I'll get into some of the specific colors in a moment. But this isn't based on optics necessarily or scientific theory or even accepted kind of color wheels um, this is a very personal look at how um, color interacted with each other and how we perceive it. 
Um, and so he, he deals with these binaries. So yellow is the color that's related to the earth, while blue is related to the heavens. Yellow seems to come towards us for Kandinsky, while blue seems to retreat away and is this ethereal, celestial presence on the canvas. Um, and he, he does this with several binaries, and then he uses this idea to, to develop these paintings. And so painting with red spot would have had a good deal of gestation. He's not just flinging paint across the canvas here. He's very deliberate um, and thinks carefully about what he's doing. But throughout the book, the, he has these marvelous and very evocative expressions of how these colors might reach us and impact us. So uh, I won't do all of them. I have a lot of them up here in case... Um, Dr. Wetzel or Andy would like to refer back, but I love what he, he says about blue, that it's not just simply that blue is one color, but that in music, a light blue is like a flute, a darker blue, a cello, still darker, a thunderous double bass, and the darkest blue of all, an organ. Um, so right here in this one painting, we kind of have a symphony collapsed into a second. We can appreciate all of these colors and the way that they appear with others. So. Yellow, he, he warns, can be shrill if it's not tempered with blue, um, and that a keen lemon yellow can hurt the eye in time as a prolonged and shrill trumpet note hurts the ear. And he, he goes on to make these, these very, very specific looks, and they're, they're not all tied to sound, but these musical analogies are an important way for him to kind of make his ideas a little bit more concrete and easier for us to grasp. And so it's very easy to imagine um, that he's either read about synesthesia and he knows a lot about it and he's kind of applying this idea of having the senses cross um, or that perhaps he himself is a synesthete. But at the end of the day, he's using these musical analogies to really justify <coughs> non-objective art that, that this painting, while we may not be able to recognize figures, still has emotional content just as music has emotional content. So... We'll page through these quite quickly. Um, but this was something that continued to fascinate Kandinsky over the course of his career. Um, in 1926, he would write another treatise called Point and Line to Plane, where he would continue to further develop his ideas about not just color, but also um, geometric form. This painting of 1925, we still see this kind of wonderful interaction of yellow, red, and blue across the surface of the, of the painting. But again, it's, it's got a little bit of a harder, more rigid geometry. Um, and then this is one of the later um, works in the exhibition. This is a composition of 1936. And Kandinsky only, only titled a few of his works compositions. And these meant that he had lots of preparatory studies and he had really fully digested it. But again, it's this symphonic use of color and form um, to provide <clears throat> A, a very um, exuberant and kind of uplifting feeling within the painting. So that's, I think that that will leave us off with Kandinsky, and we can return to some of these ideas. But Dr. Wessel will help us explain um, and understand synesthesia better. Thank you, Megan. Um, first of all, Hearing color, seeing sound. How many people here can hear color or see sound? Please raise your hand. I want a list. Shirley, please come up and sign up after we speak. <laughs> it's a very real phenomenon. And the word to describe it is synesthesia. And that word was invented. Let, let me back up a little bit before the word was invented. <clears throat> the first record of hearing sound was described by a physician and philosopher in England in eight, uh, 16, uh, actually 1680. I have 1780 here, but 1680. And he had a patient who described red as sounding like a sharp trumpet. That description um, sort of faded. Nobody paid much attention to it, again, until in the early 1700s, actually 17, uh, no, 18, 1812, there was a German physician who described it in himself. 
and he used the term colored hearing. And he described what we now know as, as synesthesia. But it was again not picked up until later in the 19th century and the man who invented the term synesthesia was a psychologist whose name was Francis Galton. Francis Galton had studied this phenomenon in individuals, some of his clients, and he decided that an appropriate term would be the word synesthesia, put together from two Greek words, the first one syn, as in synthetic or synthesis, all of that meaning together, and aesthesia, as in anesthesia, um, but this is aesthesia, which means the sense or feeling. So the idea was that synesthesia brought these two, two terms together in one word, which means bringing together sensation or feeling. It is described as a neurological phenomenon in which, and as Megan has already said, uh, which one uh, of the sensory or stimulation of one sensory or cognitive pathway leads to an automatic and involuntary experience in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. Now, I'm going slowly because I want you to comprehend this, that it means, for example, if you hear a sound, you may see a color. If you taste, have a particular taste, you may get a, a peculiar sensation of uh, maybe pinching on your cheek. There are a variety of these of uh, types of synesthesia. But I like to think of it as a phenomenon and not necessarily a condition because condition sounds like a disease. This is not a disease. It's a beautiful phenomenon. Um, but the same thing, again, the second definition is uh, the neurological condition or percep per perceptual experience in which two or more bodily senses are coupled. And it has also been called a joining of the senses, um, or union of the senses, or blending of the senses, the third line there. We know that it, or it appears to be, and I think we do know, that it is genetically transmitted. We do not know what the gene is. And I've been involved in research in this area for a little while, not, not very long. I'll explain that in a few minutes. But um, we know, for example, that there are families in which the phenomenon occurs. It could be. Uh, a word color synesthesia, it could be music color synesthesia, or other kinds of synesthesia, which I'll also discuss. But what, as, as you mentioned the word, people who have this phenomenon are called synesthetes. And some people who see synesthet synesthetic colors only see them in their mind's eye. There are other people who see these colors projected onto the written page, onto um, a screen, for example, like the, these yellow colors may not seem to be to a synesthete, may not seem to be the same colors as, as what you're seeing there. Now, there are, as I said, at least six types of synesthesia. Um, the most common is what's called grapheme color synesthesia. The word grapheme refers to words, like graphic words. And the, the second most common is the musical synesthesia referred to as phoneme. And that is relating to sound. <clears throat> but the grapheme is pretty clear cut. It's letters, words, and or numbers perceived as colors. When one hears, sees, or reads, well, particularly sees or reads, uh, sees, sees or reads or sees them printed. Uh, they appear as colors, a, a variety of colors. It's always automatic. It's there. It is. It never changes. Um, the same with music. 
And the, the thing about the phoneme of synesthesia is that it can not only, it does not only have to be musical sounds, it can be word sounds, the sounds of words, uh, and sounds of language, and even when you hear the sound of a language that you don't speak, or you don't understand, or you don't necessarily, not even the same alphabet, there still is a color that appears because of the sound. Does that make sense? <laughs> now, this is an example, a published example, of how a synesthete or someone with synesthesia might see numbers or letters. And those colors remain the same no matter what combinations you see. Um, I think this is, someone sent me this cartoon and I think it's very apropos, in case you can't read it, the man up in, on the right left side says, even math, because you know, you know when I see equations, I see letters in colors, I don't know why. But I wonder why the hell this stuff, what, what the hell this stuff looks like to my students. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that one of the reasons that I'm here is because I happen to be a synesthete, and I'm a word, color, and sound color synesthete. I've had this since my, all my life. My mother had it, my grandfather, and his brother. They discovered it in themselves. His, he and his brother discovered it in themselves. We don't know how much farther back it may go, but then my mother, uh, my grandfather discovered it in her or brought it out in her. And when I was, before I could read to any extent, my mother began to ask me. I have a brother, had a brother who did not have this phenomenon, but let me tell you, it is beautiful. <laughs> and because, you know, I hate to use a personal references here, but it makes it a little more pertinent, I think, to try to explain it to you. Um, this sentence, to be or not to be, that is the question. When I see that there written in a, on a book, uh, in a page, this is what I see. And it's always the same. And my colors, they, they don't show up very well because the 2B should be uh, a much better blue. B is pink, or is a darker blue, not, they're all the same. But when, when we get separated here, the word question, the first part of the uh, first syllable is this kind of beige color, but the two in the beginning and the T-I-O-N are the same color blue. And so you think, is he nuts? <laughs> but it's true, and it's, as I say, it's, uh, as I've, in having discussions and having read the literature about um, people who have this phenomenon one way or another, almost to a person, according to people who've been interviewed as well as people I've spoken to, they say, would you like to get rid of it? Do you, does it confuse you? No, I would never want to let it go. I, it's, it's just, a, you know, a, a beautiful thing. It's like living in a rainbow almost, but I'm not, I'm not really caught up in that. It's just so automatic that, um, but the phenomenon is very real. And this happens to be my numbers, just for your personal reference. <laughs> In case you want to know, but they're always the same and they're so vividly different. So when I see 49, I automatically see green and, and yellow and so forth. Uh, now, so what? <laughs> well, here are the other types of synesthesia. There is the so-called gustatory color synesthesia. Tastes are perceived in colors. I've never had these, this phenomenon, but I've quoted this quoting from other articles that the taste of beef is a rich blue, the taste of mango sherbet is lime green, and so forth. And I can relate to that, though I don't have a taste of uh, synesthesia, gustatory synesthesia. But then there's also, as I mentioned earlier, the taste texture synesthesia, which perceives with tasting 
uh, perceive shapes and textures, particularly on your skin. Now, there's a book that was written by a neurologist in the 90s named Richard Cytowic. His book is called The Man Who Tasted Shapes. And that man, specifically one of his patients, described the fact that when he tasted lemon, the lemon juice that he felt triangles on his cheek and he tasted something else and he felt the texture of uh, sandpaper rubbing on his hand. And this is an, a, an automatic thing. It is not possible to control it, but it's just there. Then the last one, sound shape synesthesias, uh, this is similar to the musical synesthesia, but the difference is that <clears throat> specific sounds and words also take on shapes. In my case, if I may make the personal reference again, the, work, the days of the week take on shapes to me. When I hear the word Monday, I see a pink cylinder, and it's just there. It's just and, and, and automatically. Uh, Wednesday is a blue sort of colored hair floating by, <laughs> and so forth. So um, the, those are the, the major types. I've combined, there, there are six recognized types, and I've combined one of those, a couple of those together, so there are only five listed. Now, what does this mean? Well, there is evidence that there is significant cross-reaction or cross-reactivity uh, among different regions of the brain that are adjacent to each other or very closely related. Uh, and it's thought that when we're born, we have too many connections formed in our brains and normally, in quote, normal people, that phenomenon, the phenomenon of what's called pruning, uh, which means that the con some of the connections that are not useful uh, tend to disintegrate or fall away so that the brain becomes better organized. But in people who have this phenomenon, those, that process of elimination, as I've referred to, elimination of excessive connections does not occur and these connections remain. So that then we get this cross reactivity or cross talk between color perception and word perception or between music perception and color perception. Um, that's the more a feasible explanation because of scientific evidence. There is also another theory that says that the normal inhibition of, cer of your circuits in your brain, the cortical circuits, uh, does, does not occur. And so things that should be inhibited, thoughts and, and flashes that should be inhibited don't, are not, are not inhibited, but there's no good explanation for that as far as I'm concerned from a genetic perspective. Um, so what, what part of the brain are we talking about? Well, this is, if we're looking at the brain at the underside of the brain, this is, this whole thing here is called the temporal lobe, and then back here is the occipital lobe. And there is a long piece of brain tissue here all the way along that is called the fusiform gyrus, for what that's worth to you. <laughs> but the fusiform gyrus is very much involved in these connections. This is the part of the visual cortex back here in the occipital lobe that interprets color. And the posterior or the back part of the fusiform gyrus is known to actually interpret words. It also interprets uh, faces and, uh, um, well, words and figures is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so that's a very important uh, area. And then up here in the temporal lobe, this is the inferior portion of the temporal lobe. On the other side is the portion that interprets music. There are, uh, Oh, well, m music on the, the, the other side, around the other way in the temporal lobe, but th there are connections there. Now, how am I doing? I'm running over. A little bit. It's okay. <laughs> okay, the scientific, I'm sorry. No, no. The, okay. Almost through. This, there is scientific evidence, 
now that is really hard science done using MRI and a special form of MRI called functional MRI in patients who have synesthesia, which indicate that there are larger bundles of white matter nerve fibers in the white matter connections between specific brain areas in the temporal lobe and specifically in word color synesthesia uh, a greater, let's see, uh, increased thickness of the cerebral cortex, the volume and surface area in the right and left fusiform gyrus and the adjacent regions. There is also, I don't have evidence for this, don't have it on the slide, but there's also evidence that in musical synesthesia there is a greater uh, fiber bundling from the uh, visual cortex to the temporal lobe music, or the portion that, that interprets music in the temporal lobe from occipital to temporal lobe. So, I've already, you already seen this, I won't go back over it. The, this is Kandinsky's uh, synesthesia. He claimed that when he was a child, that when he was mixing paints in his paint box as a child, before he even became an artist, he would hear strange hissing noises. And then, as Megan already mentioned, when he was listening to the opera, he saw colors in spirit before my eyes, wild, crazy lines sketched in front of me. And this article goes on. It's a commentary on his, the Kandinsky uh, retrospective at the Tate Modern in 2006. I won't read the whole thing, but anyway, he describes what Megan has already described. Uh, in terms of seeing colors, swirling compositions, warm, high-pitched yellow, and so forth, sonorous blue. The music brought out all of this kind of um, response. Here are some, I won't again read this list, but here are some uh, of the notable synesthetes, and um, in particular, Vladimir Nobokov and David Hockney. Vladimir Nobokov had the word color synesthesia. David Hockney has music and word. And you can go online and pull up synesthe famous synesthetes or synesthesia famous and there's a list of about 75 people, the famous people who have this. Okay, so I'm through. <laughs> Thank you. We'll try to answer some questions. <laughs> We will take questions at the end of the panel, um, so I'm sure, I know I'm very curious to learn more just about uh, Dr. Wetzel's own uh, perception of synesthesia, which is fabulous. Um, well, so uh, we've kind of been couching our discussion of Kandinsky and synesthesia. Uh, we've been hedging our bets a little bit because, again, the historical record makes it a little bit murky. But fortunately for us, right here in Nashville, we have Mr. Andy Campbell, who is quite an expert on the French composer Olivier Messiaen, who was a very well-documented synesthete. Um, and so he's going to share a little bit with us um, about this composer. So he's he's a little younger than Kandinsky. They would have been working um, at the same time. They weren't necessarily associated with one another, but I think that what this shows us is just like that list of 75 prominent synesthetes. Um, it kind of lets us tap into this idea of, of how people that have this neurological phenomenon um, kind of can use it to, to foster their creativity. So, Andy, if you could share it with us. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, who knows... Who knows um, Olivier Messiaen, who's heard the name before? And of those hands, who's heard the music, his music? Excellent. If you haven't heard his music, please go on YouTube, on Spotify, on iTunes, wherever you listen to music, and research his compositions. He was my inspiration for going to grad school. I learned of his music in undergrad and had a tremendous experience that was not the same as Kandinsky as he spoke of when he heard Lohengrin, but when I first heard Messian's music, it was an explosion of sound in my mind that I had never experienced before. I heard Quartet for the End of Time, which he wrote, uh, oddly enough, while in internment camp. He was in the, in World War II, he was interned in France in a German internment camp, and he wrote the composition while there. 
Uh, it was debuted there. He was allowed to leave the premises to go purchase a cello so that they could perform it. Um, he's, out, he's an amazing composer. And as Megan said, a well-documented synesthete. And the reason that it's well-documented is that he documented it himself. He saw color uh, when he heard sound. And then he actually developed his technique later in his life, uh, I think around 35 or so, he developed his technique to make use of the colors that he was seeing. So in a sense, if you listen to his music, you're experiencing him obviously writing music, but he's also sort of painting because he's, in, he's utilizing specific organizations of sound and of tones to communicate color. So if you'll indulge me, I get to be a little bit of a theory professor right now and go over to the piano and demonstrate. So we were thrilled whenever Andy said that he'd like to, to play our piano for us today. Just let me know whenever I need to um, advance a slide, please. Sure. Uh, so everybody knows Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms. We've all heard these names. These composers wrote in keys. They had a specific key that they used, right? A major, C major, B flat minor. Oftentimes they're using these keys to communicate something that they felt, an emotion, a feeling. They like the sound of that key for a particular reason. And those keys are, again, if you know this, bear with me, um, they're based on major scales, right? Or, excuse me, on scales, diatonic scales. So C major scale. We've all heard that a million times. What that is, is it's a, it's a succession of steps and half steps, or tones and semitones. So as this period of time was occurring historically, and artists were looking to do different things with their painting, musicians were doing the same thing. Composers were looking for new ways. And as Megan mentioned, Kandinsky heard Schoenberg. And Schoenberg, had, he was just done with tonality. He had had enough. He famously said that there, all of the combinations have, been, have occurred, so he wanted something else. Messian had a similar experience. So what he did, instead of, taking, instead of having the, uh, using the normal diatonic scale, which would be in a major key, would be a step, 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 half step, 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 half step. So he reorganized those pitches, and we call them pitch classes. We, he reorganized, um, sorry, interval classes. He reorganized them, and his, he called them mode, put them in modes, and there's seven of them. So the first mode is basically just your whole tone scale, like this. So it's at each step excuse me, each pitch is a step away from the next pitch. So you just have a whole tone scale. And if you transpose that, bear with me, you transpose that up to the next pitch, you get this. Oops, excuse me. If you transpose that again, you get the same scale over again. So there are seven modes that he created. Each can be transposed a number of times before you get the next one. So that's your melody basis. So when he heard his second mode, which is this, when he heard that, he said that that was violet blue. So I'll play that again. I just realized the first time I played that it was wrong. <laughs> Here it is again. I'm going to play it one time with just the pitches so you can hear the pitches, and then I'm going to sustain it so you can hear that as a chord. And then sustained. So he heard that melodically and harmonically as violet blue. Uh, another mode, it, so without demonstrations and without um, diagrams, if you take that same scale that I just played and you transpose it up a half step, you get this. He heard that one as gold and brown. 
So even in a half step away from each other in a scale, he heard a variation in color. So that's, melodically speaking, that's the basis on which he built his music. And we take that further, you take those modes and then you build chords out of them, you get things like this. He heard that as low to high, gold and silver. So as you go from the, bit, the bottom of that chord to the upper part of that chord, he would see a change in color. Another one would be something like this. Oops, sorry. That is violet, pink, mauve over a turquoise blue foundation. I love that about, about the end of that. Just fantastic. The thing that, as Dr. Wetzel was saying, I, I really want to be able to pick his brain and say, where's the turquoise in that? Where exactly, which parts are turquoise? Where's the foundation? So anyway. Um, my last one, the last one I wanted to play quickly is my favorite. Um, I find this topic endlessly fascinating. And musically, I don't see colors and I don't see shapes and I don't see anything. But I see imagery. I do see imagery. And the most famous one for me is the opening of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. It's the Pastoral Symphony. And I see gentle slope, sloping hills. I see green grass. I see trees. I can see that. It's tangible. I feel like it's more of me projecting that, as we've discussed. It's not something that pops into my mind. Um, but this one, this particular chord is, I think, is fantastic, and then I'll tell you what it, what it means. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> So he said that this is brilliant gold sunshine over white snow. I interpret that as this part. That's snow. You're sitting in the snow. You're standing in the snow. You're looking at the snow. And then this comes in. And that's sunshine coming up over that snow. So... If you haven't heard Messian, as I said before, please go listen to his music. Uh, two that I would suggest researching. One is Osakum Convivium. It's a motet that he wrote. Uh, it, it approaches the divine in, in ways that few pieces I've ever heard have. Uh, and the other one is Visions of the Amen. It's a piano duet that he wrote for his wife that they traveled around and performed. And he made heavy use of this, these techniques that I've touched on in that piano piece. Um, so that's it. So as we can see, <coughs> synesthesia can manifest itself in really a myriad of forms. Um, we were excited today to you know, have these different perspectives and learn about um, different artists and how they, they have um, perceived the phen phenomenon. And also to have Dr. Wetzel um, really kind of get into the, the meat of it. So, you know, synesthesia as an art historian is something that I would stumble across in my reading every once in a while. Um, but having somebody to kind of give us a peek into the mind uh, is a great, a great avenue to, to, to understand kind of the underpinnings and foundation of what this actually is. Um, well, so I would love, we would love to hear from you all if you have questions for us, um, if there's something that we haven't touched on, or if you'd just like to dive a little bit deeper. <laughs> Excuse me? Can it be learned? Okay. Can it be learned? No. It cannot, it cannot <laughs> be learned. It's, it's there. And that, that's a good question. Can synesthesia be learned? There are people who have tried to learn it, <laughs> but it's a matter of trying to memorize. And it, it, 
simply is there. It pops up. It's spontaneous. It's not. Uh, it's totally involuntary. So the answer to your question is no. <laughs> Well, if you, if you feel that, then perhaps you're a synesthete. <laughs> well, but the colors, if, if it, your musical tones are a little bit different, it's a little more confusing because words and letters and numbers are so concrete. The musical sounds are more vague, even though you get exactly the same chord, it may not it, 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 a, the quality of the music sound may be just enough different so that the interpretation is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So the color may be different. If you're seeing color, you may not see the same color every time you hear the musical sound because the musical sound may not be quite the same. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about the pruning that you were talking about. Yes. And um, I have heard that that's uh, uh, what they're looking at now in relation to autism. Mm -hmm. Some of the same kind of dynamics. Um, would you comment on that? Is, do you see a yes. relationship? Well, I do see it. And, and as a matter of fact, there is a relationship now. If you, again, go online and Google autism and synesthesia, um, there is thought to be a relationship. And it probably is related to the pruning or the too many connections kind of thing. Um, there are articles about, about that very th thing. To answer your question, uh, the pruning, I, I don't know what the evidence is in, in autism in terms of the pruning or, not, or absence of pruning, but there's, there does seem to be a scientific basis for the relationship to, to pruning and autism. Hi. In one of my careers, I was a staff psychologist at an alcohol and drug abuse rehabilitation facility. Uh -huh. And in studying drug interactions and drug actions, lysergic acid and diethylamide, LSD, has been known to cause synesthetic reactions. That's Can you right. comment on that? Well, the, has LSD, lysergic acid, uh, it has been alleged to produce synesthetic reactions. The difference there is, as far as I know, it's not always the same. In other words, the, the, the color patterns that are seen, they're more uh, psychedelic and kaleidoscopic, but uh, they're not necessarily always the same color patterns. And I can assure you, and in the literature, it says the color patterns never change. And that's true. I mean, I can I can swear to it, <laughs> and I, I think the color patterns do change in, in the uh, psychedelic experience. I don't know, do you have any evidence of anything different than that? <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Always lively at Food for Thought. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask, did Kandinsky uh, listen to music while he painted? That is something that we don't have evidence of that. And, and so that's something that it's very easy to kind of... Um, uh, to, to have that assumption whenever we talk about his kind of connections with music and, and his interest in it. But, but no, it, it wasn't one of the, it wasn't something where he would, you know, listen to maybe someone play the violin and then, then play the, the proper tone or paint the proper tone of red to reflect that. That, that isn't how, um, how he worked. He, um, his connection with music really, you know, it's, it's obviously a personal passion, but it's also something that's kind of bolstering his artistic theories. It's, it's something that he's really puzzling through and thinking about kind of philosophically and, and, um, and, and that's influencing kind of his ideas about painting and kind of the function of painting and, and how, um, you know, non-objective art can be similar to music in its effect. I think to comment on that, um, 
that painting concert, which you saw, uh, is a painting that he painted after he had heard mm -hmm. Schoenberg's uh, concert, or con con concerto, I believe, right? A, a, a performance, yeah. A performance. Yes, debut mm -hmm. performance. And it is said that he painted that painting three days later. But when I look at that painting and I can see those slabs of color, I, I can relate to how he must have heard something that perpetuated that whole concept to, to paint. It's, it kind of swoops up the canvas, if you, if you notice that. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, go back and look at this painting. And, and then there's another one in this exhibit called To the Voice. And it is in the back wall in the, in the main gallery, and it's a small painting. And it look, I, when I saw it, I could just see the voice is being sung. You know, the, the music is being sung, and there's a mouth, and then the rest of it is all very abstract. So think about that when you see To the Voice. If you want to look at the that painting again when you get home, the, the performance of at that uh, particular location was Opus Seven and A and B and Opus Eleven. One is a seven piano, seven small piano pieces, and the other is a piece for vocal and piano. So you can listen to those and then look at that painting and see what what he was actually experiencing. That was a wonderful question. So uh, when I heard you uh, describing your experience, I, I got really excited. Like, I want some of that. So, <laughs> can, I mean, can blood transfusion or something? <laughs> but uh, so I'm hearing it as an enhancement. And I'm curious about whether uh, there's any deficit uh, effect that you know of or might be a part of that, having that uh, synthetic ability. I'm sorry. What? Any deficit effect, uh, any disadvantage? <clears throat> No. no, no disadvantage. The advantages I have are that I can remember certain number series and telephone numbers and, and particularly numbers. I, I, I can kind of good about that. And I can tell if, a, if the numbers are wrong, if I've got the wrong sequence for a telephone number. And I, 385, da, 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 so and so. I, I, it's immediate blue, purple, green, uh, 385, blue, purple, green like that. And if, if I do 835, I, it's the wrong sequence. And so I, particularly remembering dates, sometimes names, but n numbers like that are, are it's very handy. <laughs> yeah, the question also comes out of whether without the pruning, there's some kind of over, too much uh, stimulation or too much. I think so. I mean, I think that's the crosstalk. It's like, the, it's, you know, the, the theories in uh, what I showed you there in the theories is, are that there is too much, it's not really shorting out, but it's, it's sort of blasting <laughs> so that these colors just come out like that. And it, it, it um, is what's, what's referred to as crosstalk. Has this been has this been found to be more common in some cultures, some ethnicities? Is it worldwide? Well, I can't. I really can't answer the question. I would say I speculate it probably is worldwide because of the way the brain is formed in humans. However, or not for or you know <laughs> messed around with, but <laughs> but <clears throat> um, there are other. Language cultures in Russian for Russia, for example, uh, I know Vladimir Nabokov says in his book Speak Memory, which was published in the 80s, I guess, he has a short story in there about his own experience as a child when, and it's the Russian alphabet, that he complained to his mother that the colors on his building blocks were the wrong colors. <laughs> and that's documented and it's an interesting little read that little thing i don't know about uh, uh, you know you wonder about asian cultures for example or cultures in which the language is entirely different i must say when i hear chinese spoken i don't get a, a brilliant array of colors but i do get sharp colors uh, it's different than words that i'm familiar with you know a language that i'm familiar with so it's just that it's my lack of knowledge about the language, I think, that doesn't quite give me an image of the words, if that makes sense. 
Listen, I could talk about this all afternoon, so don't bore, you. <laughs> don't bore yourselves. <laughs> Hardly, not at all. We could listen all afternoon. Yes, it's fascinating. I think I, we probably have time for one more question. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wonder if this ability that Messiaen had is reciprocal in the sense that Mr. Campbell mentioned when he heard a chord, he saw a scene. Um, is it the reverse when he saw a color? Did he hear music? No, I, he was very clear about that. He, he said, uh, how Dr. Wetzel said it, it was in his mind's eye. It was never projected. It was never out in front of him as a color. It was something that he sensed in, in, in his mind's eye, as Dr. Wetzel said. So it didn't go the other, it was only one direction. Not an F fully, uh, something that they can control necessarily. Um, I tell you what, that was a quick one. So we can do one more. Oh, sorry. Yeah, one <laughs> I believe Kandinsky was a synesthete. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could take one more, yes. So what about your case? It goes in reverse too. Like if you, for example, are talking about that num when you look numbers, you can see colors. So, or the opposite, when you see, so how it goes, that both directions? Um, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand your question. So, for example, if you look like numbers, right. you immediately look the colors. But if you look, for example, to and look at some kind of paint from Kandinsky and just look the colors, could you see numbers there? No. Look at Kandinsky's paintings and see. No, it doesn't reverse itself that way. Well, the mind is truly a wondrous thing. Um, I, and I will tell you that there really is a much broader discussion that can be had about Kandinsky um, and scientific currents. And so if you're curious, please come back and join us this Thursday, November 6th at 6.30, right here. Um, we have a speaker named Dr. Linda Dalrymple-Henderson, who's coming to us from the University of Texas. And he's going to be talking, she, excuse me, she's going to be talking about Kandinsky in his 20th century context and specifically looking at theosophy, also about the scientific discourse of the period and how some of those ideas found their way into Kandinsky's theories and his paintings. So again, if you're curious, please come back and, and learn more, another facet of this uh, discussion. And finally, please come and join us again on um, December 2nd for the final panel um, in our Food for Thought series. We'll be discussing um, spirituality and Kandinsky and also looking at some of the other exhibitions that are on view here at the Frist Center, including Sanctity Pictured. And that will again, as Gail said, be with Mark Scala and Dr. Emily Towns. Uh, so thank you all for coming here today, and thank you to both of the panelists for joining me up here and for sharing their expertise. <laughs>